Democrat and Republic. We don't, I, the, 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 the dispensation or whatever has, has changed enormously in America. It used to be, as, as, as you will well know, that the South was democratic. It was called the Democratic South. It was the heartland of the, of the Democratic vote, the, the, the blue vote on the map. That has changed enormously. And now it's uh, states like your splendid Wisconsin, which is lovely, except when I was there, it was always minus 30, so it was like quite <laughs> tricky <laughs> uh, to see a lot of it. But, um, so we don't really know. We just think Democrat is vaguely liberal and left-wing, and a Republican is mostly, at the best, laissez-faire, anti-government, uh, at worst, ne neoconservative, you know, uh, right-wing, uh, Christian, re Republican sense that w we find pretty uncomfortable, or a lot of us do. So I think we wanted a change, but if that same man, Obama, I think there would have been a, a great deal more ease about him coming in as a, as a Republican, in the same way that if Colin Powell, it was an interesting time when Colin Powell, it seemed, could have been the candidate. Colin Powell, who, who seemed to have dignity and intelligence, was a proven successful general in his own way uh, and chief of staff, um, as far as I know, he was offered by the Republican Party the, 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 the nomination uh, and turned it down for all kinds of reasons. Who knows why anybody turns down a nomination? The cynic will say because he's got a skeleton in the cupboard that he knows the press will find out. Um, the more uh, charitable spirit will say, well, because, you know, who, who needs that kind of thing after the career he's had? But if Colin Powell had stood instead of... Uh, instead of George W., I think, I think a lot of Europeans would have said, no, it's okay, we can, we can deal with that. Um, so maybe, yeah, maybe it's... Because I, I don't think we really get what it is to be the public. It, it's an irony, isn't it, that, that George W. Bush, for all his faults, created the most diverse cabinet in American mm. history, yeah. appointed not one but two African-Americans as his yeah. Secretary of State, and... One of whom was quite unashamedly a woman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the other great thing about Condoleezza Rice is that people yeah. didn't get to hate her because she was black or because she was but woman. It's because she was. She incompetent. She was yes. She was staggering. And terrified. She, yeah. um, no, I. I but, yeah. oh, but he, in important ways, apart from being such a dreadful president that the Democrats mm. were encouraged, enabled Obama to run in a way that even Bill Clinton hadn't been able to do. No, I think that's a very good point. Uh, uh, you know, there, on the other hand, you, you only, I mean, you looked at Cheney and Rumsfeld um, sort of done up in coats. They looked so exactly like, like the Soviet leaders in the 1960s waving at tanks. I mean, they were almost <laughs> identical physically, the same yeah. grey pallor, the same merciless... And, and the... And, Cheney, oh. the thing that scared the Jesus out of me was that Cheney didn't care if anybody liked him. I thought that I really disliked politicians' desire to be loved and their anxiousness to spin things so that people saw the best side of them. Cheney didn't give a toss. He would just kind of grin like that, as would Rumsfeld, if someone accused him of unbelievable corruption with their private companies, unbelievable coercion of... Uh, 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 unbelievable use of, you know, san sanctioning of torture. They just, he didn't care what we thought. Go to hell, we don't care. And that, that is actually more frightening than... And so I think no matter how diverse and pluralist the, 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 the cabinet may have been, in the end you just think of Wolfowitz and Rumsfeld and Cheney yeah. and your heart is yeah, chilled. Um, we have time for one more question, um, which will come from the gentleman there. Uh, you talk about the um, sense of humour, the American sense of humour, and we haven't really touched, you haven't mentioned so much the British sense of humour, but do you think they differ hugely? And if so, what accounts for that difference? It's a really good point. I think, um, it, I mean, it strikes at the heart of what is American optimism is, is a really important thing, but not only optimism, but a, um, a, a refusal to see oneself in a bad light or, you know, I won't, one could talk about this for far too long, but... but the, the, if you go to an American bookshop, by far the biggest section is self-help and improvement. The, you know, the idea that, that life is refinable and improvable and that you can learn a technique for anything, whether it's lovemaking, being a, a businessman, a marriage, cooking, losing weight, 
Uh, whatever it is, there's, a, there's an NLP way of doing it, there's an Anthony Robbins way of doing it, there's a things they didn't teach you at Harvard way of doing it. There's an unbelievable sense that life is improvable, that you can be lectured at, or indeed given a sermon at. You know, that that's, it's the Protestant base of America that, that things are done by text and by works as opposed to by submission and by you know, a doctrine in the way that the higher church, you know, European you know, rump, yeah, we still believe. And, and there is a sense of original sin in Europe. I mean, this is a bizarre theory that I won't push to its limit, but when it comes to comedy, it, it's satisfactorily, I think, obvious that the American comic hero is a wisecracker who is above his material and who is above the idiots around him. And the British comic Put it this way, the American comic hero, like John Belushi or someone like that. Is the, you know that scene in uh, Animal House where, the, where there's, a, play, there's a fellow playing folk music on a guitar and John Belushi picks up the guitar and destroys it. And the cinema loves it because he just smashes it and then waggles his eyebrows at the camera. Everyone says, God, he's so great. Well, a British comedian would want to play the folk singer. <laughs> You, we want to play the failure. All the great British comic heroes are, are, are people who want life to be better and who, on whom life craps from a terrible height and whose sense of dignity is constantly compromised by the world letting them down. They want to wear a tie. They're not quite smart enough to wear an old school tie because they're kind of lower middle class. They are Arthur Lowe in, in Dad's Army. They are... Anthony Aloysius Hancock, they are Basil Fawlty, they are Del Boy, they are Blackadder, they're not quite the upper echelons, and they try to be decent and right, everything tries to be proper, they're even David Brent from The Office, and their lack of dignity is embarrassing, they are a failure, they are an utter failure, they're brought up to expect empire and respect and decency and being able to wear a blazer in public and everyone around them just goes... <laughs> <laughs> Whereas the American hero is the smart talk. He's Jim Carrey and he's Ben Stiller and he's, you know, okay. whoever. He just goes all the way back. They can wisecrack their way, way out of any situation. They win the girl. They're smarter. They've got the biggest knob in the room. <laughs> the British guy arrives at the room and says, Oh, my God, I've left my, left my knob behind. <laughs> I, I haven't even got one. And... <laughs> In a sense, comedy is the microcosm that allows us to examine the entire difference between our two cultures. Ours is bathed in failure, but we make a glory of our failure. We celebrate it. We love the fact that every great British comic hero can go into a dictionary. He's a bit of a Basil Fawlty. He's a bit of a Captain Mannering. He's a bit of a Steptoe. He's a bit of a, he's a, bit of a Baldrick. He's a bit of a Blackadder. He's a bit of a this. He's a, you know, they're, they're characters that we recognise, all of them so flawed as to be an utter disaster. But you can't do that with American comedy. You can't say he's a bit of... Who's that chap in Friends? Or he's a bit of a... You know, it doesn't really work. They're not characters at all. They're just brilliant repositories of fantastic killer one-liners. We, we have to go, but in name-dropping terms, we few, happy few, have been able to say that we've spent an hour with Stephen Fry and it's been a joy. Thank no, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's premiere time next tonight here on Sky Arts 1. Sandy Toxvig is in the chair and Sue Perkins and Chris Addison are your team captains. For all new What the Dickens, stay where you are, it's just moments away.